Welcome to the NWADTC Project Echo. I'm Kent Under, and I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, Dr. Brian Wu, to introduce our guest. Well, we're very lucky today to have Mark Schubert with us. Dr. Schubert, uh, some of you probably know from AETC activities. Dr. Schubert is professor of oral medicine and dental director for NWAETC, and he's going to talk with us today about a, a very underappreciated topic, um, dental health for HIV patients. So, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks. Uh, indeed, a pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, wonderful set of presentations. I know as even though I'm a dentist, I'm looking at the, the ECHO presentations uh, to try to keep up and date, up to date and understanding of uh, management of HIV positive patients. When HIV was first recognized in the early 80s, thorough cavity oral health was dominated by weird lesions that were hard to diagnose and even harder to manage. With the improvement with uh, HIV care, with heart therapy, uh, successful uh, being able to reduce viral load, improve CD4 counts, the, these weird lesions, these major oral problems have for the most part been all but eliminated. And we've come back to the situation now where we're dealing with the oral health of our patients. Even some of the, the most basic of issues are what we're struggling with these days. I think we're all aware of the fact that uh, healthy teeth, bright smiles, do a, a number of positive things for us as individuals. Uh, yes, project a positive image, give us self-confidence, uh, allow us to be more socially acceptable among our peers, friends, and, uh, and contacts, uh, allows for normal oral function, and in general, improves the quality of life. A poor dentition, severe decay, periodontal disease, lost teeth can be devastating, obviously, for the patients. And so for many of our HIV-positive patients, et cetera, they're faced with these sorts of challenges: uh, the socially displeasing presentation, the bad breath, the socially unacceptable, so to speak, uh, presentation. Uh, there is an unfortunate uh, attitude among a lot of people that patients with poor dentition also have a lower IQ that is obviously not true. Uh, and the most important thing, however, is that the fact that when we look at the benefits of good oral health, obviously presentation, uh, aesthetically, oral function, no, uh, no pain, uh, et cetera, we have come to recognize, however, that the poor dental health, you know, dental disease, dental infections, et cetera, can have a, a very significant impact on the systemic health of patients. And it's a two-way arrow. Oral disease can affect systemic health, and systemic health can affect oral disease. Probably the area that we have the best understanding is, is the status of periodontal disease for the patient who has diabetes. We know that the periodontal infections can lead to more difficulty in controlling the diabetes. We also know that the patient who is more poorly controlled relative to their diabetes is going to have worse periodontal disease, probably related to immune dysfunction that's associated with the periodontal disease. Oral infections can lead to deep space infections in patients, and then a whole list of other situations that we're aware of across other areas of medicine where poor dental health, especially periodontal disease, can affect the overall systemic health of the patient. From the list you see there, you know, obviously aspiration pneumonias in the intubated ICU patients. Uh, there is a lot of attention being paid to the impact of periodontal disease on cardiac health. One of my main areas of uh, work is with the hematologic oncology patients, and we definitely know that dental disease can spread systemically when the patients are profoundly neutropenic. There was just a recently a, a publication that showed an association with one of the oral, and more specifically, periodontal bacteria with being a risk factor for colon cancer. In the post hemopoietic cell transplant patient who has graft-versus-host disease, we have seen numerous instances where poor dental health, dental infections more specifically, can actually worsen GVHD status, uh, lead to uh, poor ability to control the GVHD, etc. It's possible, it's never been studied, as best as I can tell, but could dental infections actually affect HIV replication? If infections, other infections tend to increase HIV replication, could low-grade, even periodontal disease, 
dental abscesses, et cetera, potentially affect uh, HIV control for the patients. One point I obviously want to really stress here uh, relative to oral health is that the use of uh, tobacco products, especially smoking, is clearly a habit that can worsen dental disease and make it much more difficult uh, to control. There, have been, there was a study that we did uh, through the university back in about 2001, and it has just recently been uh, duplicated and published, uh, looking at uh, the, the dental health, the dental status relative to HIV spe uh, specifically, and what's going on uh, in the mouth. And clearly today, the most common oral problems for HIV positive patients are dental decay, gingivitis, and periodontal disease. A lot of factors affect access to dental care. We're all aware of lack of dental insurance, limited financial resources. Uh, obviously here at the Northwest AETC, we're trying to work on the third point, dentists who are trained and willing to treat HIV positive patients. As it turns out, there's very little difference we do with patients relative to treating dental disease uh, that uh, is specific for HIV. Yes, we will want to know the medical status of patients. We want to stay on top of their HIV disease and how it's being managed. But once we get in there and start doing fillings and cleanings and crowns and all that other sort of standard dental care, there's little or no difference. Uh, the lack of uh, state or national funding for dental care, for, especially for adults. Uh, patients will also bring to, to us uh, all their fears and a dislike of going to the dentist, which is obviously not just purely restricted to HIV positive patients. So again, we have a lot of additional factors to consider as we try to get our patients in for uh, routine dental care. To understand oral health, it kind of helps to do a, a real brief review of what's at the heart of most of the dental disease a patient's going to have. So tooth decay and gum disease. Uh, at the, at the, it's, I tell my dental students that actually if we were to compare ourselves to a medical specialty, the one that we're most close to is infectious disease because most of the oral problems we deal with, other than the cosmetic ones, are going to be related to uh, bacterial occasionally fungal activity in the oral cavity. At the heart of dental disease is what we call uh, bacterial dental plaque, okay? It is actually truly quantifiable, qualifiable these days as a biofilm. If you take a tooth surface and completely clean it off, you know, down to the lowest level you possibly can, over the next several hours, uh, proteins and carbohydrates will start attaching to the clean enamel or dentin surface. Shortly after that, bacteria will start attaching to uh, this pellicle. Secondary uh, uh, bacteria will start coming in, and you, you move into a truly uh, biofilm with a, a vertical, so to speak, uh, organization. Over a 1,000 different bacteria have been associated with this biofilm. Acids, enzymes, inflammatory products are produced by these bacteria. On the dental surface, decalcification will occur. Soft tissue surfaces, we get infl inflammation and subsequent infection of the tissues. Factors that affect dental health are most primarily going to be related to inadequate oral hygiene. Patients may not have been properly trained or they may be unmotivated. Diet will affect the rate at which the bacteria will grow. Other conditions such as dry mouth can increase the, the rate at which the bacterial plaque will grow. Diets that are high in uh, acids, so uh, uh, citrus fruits, uh, carbonated beverages, but even the patient with GERD is going to have more acid attack of the tooth surface leading to more damage. So bacteria, teeth and gums, substrate for the bacteria to live on. This is our kind of our triad of factors. So if we can control any one of these circles and move it away so there's no overlap, we can technically and hopefully reduce dental disease. Dental decay will start on enamel surfaces. Okay, the acid would lead to uh, decalcification, breakdown of the organic matrix. That's essentially what tooth decay is. If the decay goes deep enough, okay, we'll get into the nerve and blood supply of the patient, so inflammation. Patient starts to get a toothache with subsequent infection that can spread to the root tip and then to the, uh, the surrounding bone. 
Specific for periodontal disease, what we have is that as the inflammation builds up, bone doesn't like infection, so bone levels uh, will be lost. Support for the tooth will be lost. This is essentially periodontal disease or periodontitis, and teeth will be lost because of inadequate support of the teeth. So as we look at the pictures, examples of, again, tooth decay and widespread uh, periodontal disease. Control of disease is pretty much dependent on the patient. Uh, there are no cell phone apps that will allow us to uh, clean up our mouths uh, effectively. They might remind us, but they're not, we still have to do the work ourselves. Tooth brushing, very simply, very quickly. Uh, soft toothbrush, a sulcular scrub where you angle the toothbrush along the gum line. For most adults, this is the most important area to be kept clean. Toothpaste, really doesn't matter. Any of the major manufacturers, major brands of toothpaste are going to be fine. If a patient has decay, if there's an increased risk for tooth decay, then some of the more specialized toothpaste that have remineralizing uh, properties could be useful. Top on this list is probably the prescription strength fluorides. These are readily available. Patients can brush them on their teeth. Okay, let them sit for several minutes after brushing, spit them out, use them once a day. Significantly increase the decay resistance for the tooth surfaces. Uh, I often tell my patients this is inexpensive dental uh, uh, insurance. You can use these to stay on top of uh, dental health and reduce the risk of dental decay. When it comes to flossing, waxed, unwaxed, fine, extra fine, glide, Teflon flies, floss, doesn't really matter which one you use. Most important thing is that you use it. You can use your hands. There are what we call flossers out there that, that allow the patient to get to the bottom of the pockets and get the plaque out of those areas to keep the, the gum tissues clean. Standard recommendations, twice a day tooth brushing, once a day flossing. This is pretty much for everyone. Uh, this is what I do myself. This is what I recommend for oh, probably 95% of my patients. A patient with periodontal disease, more uh, significant disease, yes, we may need to, to get a few extra uh, pieces of equipment to them and have them use them. Patients need to be trained on the correct technique. Unfortunately, too many times the dentist, the hygienist, does not take the patient into the clinic, show them exactly what they need to do. Electric toothbrushes, manual toothbrushes, again, it mainly depends on what works best in the patient's hands and what allows for compliance with that protocol. Good oral health, you can't get lazy. You can't start skipping and flossing once a week or twice a week. It needs to be daily. Toothbrushing, again, minimum once a day, and we do prefer twice a day. Teach the patient how to, for instance, multitask. You can floss while you're doing emails, watching TV, reading the newspaper. So the, the whole idea is try to design a protocol and a program for the patient that allows them to be successful. For patients who need extra help, there are antibacterial mouthwashes such as chlorhexidine. Patients can mix up for themselves doxycycline or minocycline rinses. These are very effective against a lot of the uh, more major uh, species of bacteria associated with bacterial plaque. Some of the extra equipment that I refer to, interproximal brushes, uh, tongue scrapers, uh, water irrigators, these can be used, but understand the heart of the oral hygiene program still needs to be brushing and flossing and will augment ba uh, based on how successful the patient is at maintaining oral health. So kind of in summary, oral health does uh, support systemic health. To be effective, brushing and flossing and oral hygiene programs need to be effectively trained and need follow-up. But the good news is, this is the, it's the same thing for an HIV-positive patient that we would be doing with uh, a non-HIV patient. As providers, we need to understand the basics of dental infections okay, and provide that supportive care and looking to integrate, looking at teeth and looking at gums, understanding patients' dental health along with the rest of their primary care. But at the same time, the dental 
healthcare providers, the dentists, the hygienists need to be uh, an active part of the patient's ongoing care as best we can possibly do it uh, to support and maintain advocate oral health. Beautiful smiles, fresh breath, yeah, we love it. But understand that in our patients, we're going beyond that to keeping them systemically healthy. So 